Good morning and welcome to this session of Business Breeders, a live webinar series hosted by Goodman Group at Brock University. My name is Abdul Rahimi and it's my distinct pleasure to serve as the director of Goodman Group here at Brock University. Goodman Group is a community-focused learning and development services provider that works to support professionals, businesses, entrepreneurs pursuing growth through professional development certificate programs, executive education, consulting services, and startup support. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome so many of you today to, to today's session as you take your break with us. This webinar series aims to provide 45 minute breeders that are filled with insightful discussions on timely topics that are relevant to businesses and everyday lives, led by award-winning Brock University faculty and leading industry experts, encouraging thoughtful debates and keeping us all feeling connected all together. This webinar series is hosted on Wednesdays from 11 to 11.45. In a moment, I will hand the screen over to today's webinar lead, and that is Dr. Robert Luke, who will lead the discussions. But I will just pause for a moment and go through the format of today's session. Like the previous ones, Robert will speak for approximately 30 minutes, and then there will be time, ample time, to answer your questions. Some of you have already posed your question at the time of registration. Thank you very much. And others, you may type your questions into the chat feature if you're watching this live. Uh, so that's, that's, that's using, using the chat feature uh, that's live now. And you can also uh, tweet them. You can tweet your questions and comments at GSB Goodman Group, that's one word, at GSB Goodman Group, and we'll be happy to answer as many of those as we can. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's webinar lead. That's Dr. Robert Luke, who is the Chief Executive Officer of eCampus Ontario, which provides leadership to Ontario's universities and colleges promoting innovation and adoption of digital learning. Prior to his role as the CEO, Dr. Luke spent over 10 years in executive management as Vice President, Research and, Innova and Innovation at George Brown College and an OCAD University. His expertise is in human-centered knowledge media design, working at the <clears throat> intersection of education and information science to produce useful and usable technology to support education, health, and innovation systems. His experience includes the development of academic business, innovation, and incubation initiatives. Dr. Luke has extensive experience in the evaluation of national research and innovation systems. He served on the Council of Canadian uh, Academies Experts Panel Review of the State uh, of Science and Technology and the State of Industrial Research and Development in Canada, amongst other such involvements of which there are numerous ones. Robert was also awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his contribution to Canadian education and innovation. There are many more accolades to uh, speak about, but we'll leave time for the presentation and your question. Robert, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Abdul. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm uh, just going to share my screen so that I can proceed. Looks like we're we're all good. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be here um, uh, to uh, talk with you today. And thanks to Abdul and uh, Cassie from the Goodman Group uh, at Brock University. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, digital by design education for the post pandemic world. Uh, before I get started on that, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm coming uh, to you from the East Toronto, and uh, I'm putting showing this link up here, which is nativeland.ca. I'm on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And it's very important for us to acknowledge uh, those whose uh, land we are sharing as part of our commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, calls to action, particularly as it relates to uh, uh, education, uh, post-secondary education, and the sphere that I operate in, uh, but also in our, our general social commitment to uh, decolonization more broadly. And you can go to this link, as you can see here, 
uh, and you can uh, put in your location where it says in a little bar there into your location here and you can find out whose uh, traditional territories you are on and uh, whose land you are, are sharing. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, dive right into it, but I'm going to just take a brief detour uh, to take a look at um, what I see uh, when I, not when I look out my window, uh, but when I go for a walk, uh, not every morning, but some mornings, uh, as I live in East Toronto, I live close to the lake, uh, and I'm uh, able to go down and see this. And I think it's important for us, particularly as this, at this time when our life, lives are mediated by screens, uh, to really take a moment to to uh, look on the horizon, uh, change our focal point for one thing that's good for your eyesight, uh, but also just to, to think about what it is to be outside and to be people in the world. And I think that's a good context for what I'm going to uh, be talking about with you today. Um, horizon thinking, of course, is also important when we think about strategic foresight, which is also very important to uh, businesses uh, more generally. Um, I'm not going to go over this, but this is uh, the description that you've seen already. I do hope that we're going to uh, get these objectives covered off in the next 20 some minutes, um, which is looking at uh, how technology can exacerbate social biases, why human centered design is important to consider when you want to ameliorate those, and what we can do to support the creation of inclusive digital by design environments and engagement and collaboration more broadly for sector transformation, and I would add for economic resilience and recovery. So I'm just going to start with some opening thoughts on the future of learning. Uh, it says here the future of learning is the future of work and that future is now. And I did a quick Google search for the future of work and you can see that, you know, various things are coming up from automation to uh, extended reality or virtual reality technologies. Uh, kind of like that picture of the robots on the, on the skyscraper there. Um, but the, the picture on the left of the screen also up to the need for inclusiveness and diversity. And uh, I think it's important for us to, as we all navigate the current environment, uh, mediated as we are like this, uh, that we think about what the future of work looks like and that we think about how we are working today and, uh, and what that means for what kind of future we want to bring in. Um, I'm not going to go over uh, who is eCampus Ontario because Abdul uh, helpfully um, uh, said that for us. Uh, but this is what we're going to be talking about, um, properly speaking, today, which is really not just the education of business, which I know that uh, Abdul is, is in the business of, uh, but also the business of education and how that relates to uh, the larger economic recovery and resilience that I mentioned earlier. We're going to go through these five things, uh, social imperatives, digital by design, the importance of human-centered design and design for inclusion, uh, and I'm going to end on a couple of examples for what we are doing at eCampus Ontario to help the sector navigate this future of the business of education uh, by collaborating to compete together. Uh, so first of all, I just want to uh, start on the social context. It's Black History Month. It's important for us all to join the fight against anti-Black racism and anti-BIPOC racism, so uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, at eCampus Ontario, we try to model and support equity, decolonization, diversity, and inclusion in everything we do. And fundamentally for us, this is about creating high quality learning and, and experiences for all of our learners. And fundamentally, we want to seize this moment to rebuild and support an environment that prioritizes inclusion, representation, and voice. So I'd just like to keep that in mind as we go forward, particularly as we think about the principles of human-centered design. So digital by design then is about creating options. This is about leveraging digital technologies, this thing called the internet for instance, uh, that helps us to facilitate learning in online environments, but also in, on, in those environments that are hybrids, they're face-to-face, -face, they are online as well. Um, we, can, we can support uh, learning wherever it happens by having what I'm mentioning here, mediated communities of practice. So bringing people together to share ideas, much like uh, the Business Breather is doing today. And fundamentally, we can provide ways for learners to access things like micro-credentials micro so that we can support their learning throughout the progression of their careers and also their lifetime. And, and when we think about digital by design, we think about how can we work together to collaborate to mindfully and artfully design digital learning environments that support all learners. Fundamentally here, this is looking at education that has no wrong door and no dead end. 
And what that means is we want to give learners greater control over their learning. We want to make sure that learning is articulated and laddered. And I'm going to speak a little bit uh, towards the end about micro-credentials because this is one of the key roots uh, for this. Uh, but within this, can we look at increasing collaboration and resource sharing across the post-secondary education sector? Can we find ways to decrease the total cost to the system and the students and fundamentally do while preparing our citizens to participate meaningfully in the economy? I heard somebody say once that the goal of education is to make one privately happy and publicly useful. And that always stuck with me as something that uh, that is um, it will resonate with me in terms of our role as public educators. Uh, and this idea of no wrong door and no dead end is about providing routes of access for people to access education when and where they need it and to continually build on that throughout their lives. And so just really to sum up here, the digital by design is a, and some of the best practices here is, is looking at how can we go from face to face to online and hybrid learning and really looking at that as the scaffold from learning to work, which I think, as we all know, is going to be constant and iterative. For us at eCampus Ontario, we try to think about what does that mean to support the whole learner? So the learning engagement and the interaction that happens in the classroom, be that online or face-to-face, -face, but also supporting the mental health needs, for instance, or the, the social needs of learners. Uh, we've learned a lot, for instance, about the pandemic pivot as we all went into all online all the time and what is missing from that from the informal social interaction that people generally come to campuses or workplaces and experience. So there's things that we can do to support the whole learner in that, in that regard. Uh, looking at the role of iterative evaluation and informative and summative feedback, for instance, to help people track their learning over time. Uh, can we use digital technologies to stage content, for instance, so let people dive into specific content areas that they're partic particularly interested in or something they need to be reminded of? Uh, and again, supported by communities of practice, supported by people who are thinking and doing similar things to help us go from you know, a novice to, uh, to an expert. Um, and uh, really uh, commensurate with addressing the needs of the whole learner is addressing issues of social isolation support and mentorship for all people. Uh, I'll just take a brief detour on human-centered design because I've been speaking about it and inferring a lot of the principles here. Uh, and there's a, a, a reference to a book that I read recently, which is quite good if you want to uh, look at, uh, if you're interested in innovation and interested in the idea of human-centered design and these kind of principles of you know, iterative, agile and participatory, looking at ways to co-design with other people. This is about working cooperatively together towards common goals or outcomes. Uh, it talks a lot about the importance of talking to people uh, because you learn from this. So if you want to design a product or a service, it's important to talk to people that you think will be your customer for that service. And using things like personas and use cases, which are ways to construct um, ideal uh, or 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 perceived situations that this uh, this product or service might be useful for. Uh, and then the last piece there, which is done is better than perfect, that if you sit around waiting for something to be perfect, you might never get it done. So, you know, thinking about this again from an iterative and agile way. So these are some of the principles that, uh, that we look at to help us support the post-secondary education sector in adopting new technologies and new models of collaboration. There are a few issues here, though, and it's important for us to look that look at you know what participatory models do. Uh, we can see here a few examples. Um, you know, looking at when we design uh, any piece of technology or any service, we often go for what you know is in that bell curve there, the average person or most people, and some people exist on the margins there. So it's important for us to think about that when we're designing technology. I'm going to come back to that sec in a second. Uh, and over here, we're, we see something from uh, Dean Dory Tunstall, who's the Dean of Design at OCAD University, that it's also important to decenter the human to introduce a relational model where the human is just part of the wider ecosystem. So looking at ways to prioritize the human experience and the experience of people, while also thinking about ways that we think of people as, as interacting with other people, of course, but with other uh, things in the environment. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about this, about design for inclusion, is about we really must be mindful 
that it's not just the methods, but the technologies that can that have the potential to exclude, they have the potential to include, but also to exclude either by design or just inadvertently. And if we think back to this bell curve, average person, most people, you know, that's one of the problems that we have right now with artificial intelligence, which uses large data sets to produce, uh, you know, useful and usable technologies and, and other interventions based on a lot of data about most people. But if you're some people, if you exist on the margins of what we consider the average person, then your experience is not going to get caught by the, the large data sets. And I would encourage you to look at some of the work about designing from the margins here to look at the ways in which bias can be baked into artificial intelligence. This is, this is becoming more well known, which is a good thing when we understand that the data sets that we, that we are using to produce AI aren't always as effective at reaching the entire population or the diversity of the population that we have. And we must be very mindful of that, be that in uh, technologies, uh, that uh, that are possibly inadvertently discriminating about ace uh, based on age, race, class, sexual orientation, gender identity, as it says here, and ways that we can ameliorate that. And some of the ways that we can ameliorate those baked in biases is by first of all being aware of it, and second of all uh, asking some questions of the design of the technology and intervening at the design, but also ensuring that we understand when we are faced with a piece of technology that is producing aggregate data, that what has been the, the basis for that uh, data aggregation in the first place. And always ask the question, who is not in this room? Who is not included in this data set? Who are we not thinking about as we design this technology or service? Uh, so I'm going to go on to my uh, last point here, which is about collaborating to compete together. And fundamentally here, I just want to make a few points about how the business of education is changing. And what this means is that collaboration is now a competitive advantage. And one of the things that I'm very excited to be able to be uh, supporting at eCampus Ontario is looking at ways that we can support the entire post-secondary education sector to find ways to work effectively together. This is our indigenous institutes, our colleges, and our universities, which maybe traditionally have thought about themselves as working somewhat against each other. Uh, maybe it's the colleges and the universities and the indigenous institutes. But as we've all discovered, uh, you know, with the with the, the wholesale pandemic pivot, that we are really all in this together, and we need to find ways to support the spectrum of education as all being viable and again iterative. Uh, and that we can find ways to collaborate so that that is the competitive advantage of Ontario, not just one region or, or one city or one institution against each other. So at eCampus Ontario, we're looking at several ways to do that. Um, there are three that I'll talk about here. Uh, one is shared services. The other one is collaborative development. And the third one there is micro-credentials. And fundamentally, uh, we look on this as a, as a platform business model that we have, uh, transmission, transaction, and transformation. So transmission for us is providing the, the software and transit layer or transmission layer of uh, software, for instance, that enables people to get something done or transaction. And in that transaction, they could be creating uh, digital content. It could be creating partnerships for, uh, uh, research or work integrated learning, uh, which ultimately is going to lead to transformation. And it's transformation of the individuals that we are charged with supporting as, as uh, publicly assisted education, of course, but also transformation of the sector. And again, I'll just come back to this idea that collaboration here is a competitive advantage that all of us in the sector are working together. And uh, actually it's Steve Orsini, who's the, the CEO of the Council of Ontario Universities, who I've heard use the phrase, collaboration is a competitive advantage. And I think it's a really good one uh, to, uh, to always remember. I grew up in Saskatchewan and uh, you know, growing up um, in rural Saskatchewan, if uh, Abdul was building a barn, I was building a barn. And that idea of working together, I think is really important. And we've really seen a lot of that, uh, that happen with respect to our, our response to the, uh, to the pandemic. 
So I'll talk a little bit about shared services. So we have an educational technology sandbox. You can see the link here. And the point about the sandbox is to provide a way where we can test technologies using these principles of human-centered design, for instance, uh, to allow people from across the sector to learn from and with each other as to how those educational technologies might prove most useful and usable in the assistance of learning across our colleges, indigenous institutes and universities. Uh, we work very closely with, as it says here, the Student Experience Design Lab, which gives students experience to, to put these technologies through their paces, so the students are gaining a work integrated learning experience there, while providing the student lens to what it means to uh, look at and use those technologies. We see this as very important, again, uh, operation, operating on the principles of human-centered design to ensure that these technologies can be, as I said, uh, assessed as to their use value and their general utility for learning in colleges, universities, and Indigenous institutes. Uh, the second one I'll talk about is uh, a new one called the Central Virtual Learning Platform, um, which is part of our uh, uh, support of the virtual learning strategy. And think about the Central Virtual Learning Platform as a matchmaking service that is helping our institutions access the kind of instructional design or media development or um, other professional expertise to in, in order to help them uh, more rapidly develop the kinds of digital uh, learning materials that they, uh, that they need. Uh, so really, it says here, connect with professional services. We promote licensing options and content repositories. So we, we have virtual libraries that we, uh, that we support on behalf of the sectors, the sector uh, members, uh, and also to access expertise. And we want to make sure, for instance, that uh, anything that's coming in uh, to the uh, to the virtual libraries adheres to those principles of human-centered design, uh, but is done so in a way that is agile, rapid, and iterative. And finally, I'm just going to take a, a few brief moments in the last couple of minutes that I have here to talk about micro-credentials. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about micro-credentials, and there's been a lot of discussion about these. Uh, we've been supporting uh, micro-credentials for the last four plus years. Uh, we funded uh, 36 pilots across colleges and universities to develop micro-credentials in concert with uh, uh, employer partners to support this kind of iterative and agile learning. Uh, there's a URL there where you can uh, access a bit more information about our approach to micro-credentials, but I want to take a few moments to talk about this, to go back to what it means to you know, transition from the education of business to the business of education. Uh, those of us who may uh, be old enough might remember 20 plus years ago when Napster came along. Uh, here's an interesting article from the BBC from uh, last year, almost a year ago now, uh, where it talks about how Napster turned 20 and how it changed the music industry. And uh, if you're not familiar with Napster, although I'm sure you are, I'm, you are familiar with their, um, uh, the technologies and the services that have come since Napster, Apple Music, Spotify, for example, and, and anything to do with streaming. And this is important for us to understand because when Napster came along, the internet was relatively new, it was the 90s, and uh, at the time the music industry was pretty much focused on selling you an album. Uh, you could possibly buy a single if you really wanted it to, but you, you pretty much were limited in terms of what you could buy. If you liked that song, you had to go buy the whole album, the whole record or the CD. Uh, what Napster did uh, was a couple of things, actually. They said, well, if you like just that one song, why can't you just get that one song? And why can't you play that song on any device? And so this is where, where streaming came in. Now, we could probably have quite a long discussion about the changes that have been wrought onto the music industry. Um, were they positive or were they negative? Were some positive, were some negative? Do the positives outweigh the negatives or vice versa? Uh, and fundamentally, though, what I would like you to take away from this is that we are at a very similar moment in industry disruption with micro-credentials when you think about the birth of music streaming. And if we go back and look at Napster here and how it changed the music industry. And my point is that uh, we are witnessing a very significant transformation uh, with micro-credentials, whereas before, uh, credential was 
you know, you went to college, university, and you had a diploma, maybe a two-year, a three-year advanced diploma, a four-year degree. You could get a one-year graduate certificate. You could then get a master's degree, and you can get a doctorate uh, and you know, various permutations in between. And with micro-credentials, we're seeing uh, the, the disruption of that model and the idea that you can now get education in more bite-sized components that might be able to or should be able to stack up into others. So here's, a, here's the, the mantra for us is that micro-credentials are fast, affordable, and industry-focused. Uh, here's a, a piece from the Ontario government. The Ministry of Colleges and Universities, of course, has announced a micro-credential strategy uh, last November 5th in the Ontario budget. Uh, and this outlines where we see that micro-credentials are right now and where they are headed. They're competency-based, they're for in-demand professions, they're flexible, and they can be taken on online at your own pace. They're relevant to the job market and co-created with employers. They're stackable, so they complement other education. So that idea that you could still go and get your, your undergraduate degrees or your graduate degrees, that's still very important as milestone markers. But now you can do these and do that in ways that are iterative. So think again about that, that approach of human-centered design or those principles of iterative and agile. Uh, that, are, that are now being seen applied to the education business. Uh, they're also trackable. They're, so they're stackable and trackable. They are stackable into other larger educational milestones, but they're trackable. They're digitally certified so that you've got a record of these and you can see, well, what competencies and skills have I learned? What milestones have I, have I achieved? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that we have an annual micro-credential forum. It's coming up on February the 26th. Uh, the registration opened this morning, as a matter of fact, so you can go to that URL and take a look at it. If you're interested in learning more about this approach to learning and micro-credentials in particular, I would encourage you to go and check that out. So I'm just going to end with this uh, statement, which uh, in some respects is a, is a crib on a, a well-known William Gibson quit, quit, uh, quote, uh, which the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Uh, the business of education has already been disrupted. It's our goal and our role now to figure out what is the best way to constitute it according to the conditions that we're working in now and the conditions that we expect to be working in in the future. That includes our commitment to equity and decolonization, diversity and inclusion, and supporting all learners, regardless of age or stage, to acquire the kinds of skills and competencies that they need to be meaningful and productive contributors to our society. Um, with that, I will end. And if you want to contact me, you can hear. And I think we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. So I want to stop sharing and turn it back over to Abdul. Robert, thank you very much. I was just making some notes in here as well as listening to your presentation. Very insightful. And um, it's good to know that our, for our viewers who, have, who are watching this live, that the Micro-Credential Forum is open live. So that's another reason to be joining sessions like these and getting the word, the good word out. Uh, I suspect I will be uh, joining that forum myself as well, uh, given my line of work and business in here. Uh, so as I look to my other screen, uh, to my left, perhaps you're right, and look, at, look for the questions. Uh, so here's a comment on a question. So eCampus, Ontario has established itself as a center of excellence in Ontario and has a clear strategic plan. So kudos to you. The pandemic has made e-learning matter of great importance and urgency. The question is, how will eCampus Ontario balance its urgent response with the long-term goals? Well, thank you for that question. I think it, it's actually very important. And I would say a couple of things about that. Um, we are actually in the process of, of writing a new strategic plan, which will be ready uh, for April. Uh, and that's just a reflection of our existing strategic plan uh, went until March of this year. But that said, I would say that uh, the, the capacity of eCampus Ontario was well suited to support the pandemic pivot that our members at our post-secondary education institutes need to go through. And what we were able to do is provide that kind of just-in-time support while working very closely with the sector, again, using these principles of human-centered design to listen and talk to our members and find out what they need in order to provide these services and supports. 
So those things like I was talking about, the shared services, the collaborative virtual learning platform, the micro-credential support, those are things that we have been asked to do by our members. And our, actually the other thing I would say about this is the thing that we learned on or about March 12th of 2020, uh, when the decisions were taken to, uh, to move everything online as a consequence of the pandemic, is e-learning at that point in time, I mean, it has been around for a long time. I personally have been involved in developing e-learning or online learning or virtual learning since about 1994. And there are many who have, uh, have experienced even before that. So it's always been with us, but it's always been a nice to do. The difference now is it was the only thing that we could do for most of our learning. And so the, the idea here is, as a, your question has said, it's, it's taken on greater importance and urgency. So what we are looking at, and one of the ways we're doing this is with the, the virtual learning strategy, which was announced last December, is how can we support the, the uh, post-secondary education environment to make this semester better than last semester as we continue our support for virtual while presaging a future that will always have some aspect of hybrid learning. So that there's always going to be some online and always some face-to-face. -face. Because learning online, as we now know, is a core competency that we all need. Working online is a core competency that we all need. So I think what we have seen is the, you know, the, the mainstreamification, if you will, of, of e-learning within a, a you know, post-secondary education is not known for innovating its business models with alacrity. And so the idea here is that we're able to help scaffold in that future, which, as I said, is now into supporting our, our uh, members to deliver the best quality education while understanding that the whole learner needs to be supported. So I think, you know, to wrap that up, I would say, you know, we continue to listen to our members and provide the just in time supports while looking ahead, doing some foresighting with our members to say, well, what does the future look like and how do we prepare for that together? Awesome. This next question feeds into that as well. And it's, so, as we know, many secondary, post-secondary institutions has uh, been affected by the resources in particular, the financial resources that uh, come as a result of students and also governmental funds. With mainstream uh, implications or mainstream, sort of e-learning becoming more mainstream, are you seeing a uh, financial windfall in your direction as well, or, is, or are you experiencing more what other post-secondary and tertiary institutions are seeing? Um, example that comes to mind, the recent news articles around Laurentian University and uh, filing in for insolvency. Where, the, where are you finding eCampus? Is it on the opposite spectrum because of this new height, heightened uh, and mainstreamification of e-learning? That's a really good question. And, you know, certainly in the back of my mind, as we talk about the disruption of the post-secondary education business environment is the recent news uh, out of Laurentian. Uh, my colleague Alex Usher has done some interesting work on uh, uh, what what that looks like for other other comparable universities and colleges. Ken Steele had a really good report out today on that as well. I think the I, what's really important to understand here is that Developing high quality virtual learning costs money. Like it's not cheap to do this work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, and it assumes that there's a high digital fluency capacity to engage this. It assumes that we've got a good internet connection. Uh, so far, so good for us in our internet connection. I moved close to my router for this talk. Uh, for instance, like we have as one of uh, my former graduate students uh, said to me uh, uh, when we were doing some work last summer, the privilege of isolating. And that's really important for us to remember. But it does cost more money to develop this kind of learning. And that's important when we think about our the business model of education. When I was a professor and I was teaching, you know, I had to be prepared, obviously, to teach my class. Uh, and I would prepare my slide decks and make sure that the students had some questions and some readings. But I came to my class and I gave my lecture and maybe we had a discussion and it was highly extemporaneous. It was it was kind of like what we're doing right now. We you know we show up and we have a good discussion, and that's what makes learning really good. That kind of dialogue or the dialogic model of of interaction and the interplay of ideas. When we need to produce that upfront, it requires more work, more time, and more energy, and more people. Instructional design, copy editing, media development, um, you know, virtual reality, for instance, requires a lot of programmers. 
uh, learning management systems required backend IT support. So I, I think it's really important for us to understand that you know developing high quality virtual learning is not a cost saving measure. Uh, it is a recognition that the business model of education has changed and that as we change with it, we need to ensure that we are providing the basic infrastructure in order to meet the needs of the students, certainly the students that we have today, but the students that we want to get tomorrow. And I think that relates back to this idea of collaborating to compete together because the the my my as a college or a university or an indigenous institute in Ontario, my competitor is not Brock University or Niagara College. My competitor is the next national or subnational jurisdiction that is investing heavily in virtual learning in order to attract students from our region into their region. And so I think it's important for us to look at this holistically in terms of you know the cost and the benefit um, and return on investment for sure. Uh, that the investments that we are collectively making virtual learning today have definitive and definite uh, paybacks in our ability to support professors like you abdul and the students that that come to our our classes but also in the capacity of our sector to be more resilient as we recover and anticipate that future of learning which as i said is hybrid mm -hmm. And this next question ties well into this uh, conversation and the and the Napster example, which I had sort of a bit of a flashback as well. Obviously, that's going back a little bit, so showing my age here. Um, what, where do you see the future of micro credentials in ten to fifteen years' time? Um, what would be the implications and opportunities for the existing structures of education systems, in your view? the existing structures did you say the 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 structure of existing institutions and the way that we operate in, in at universities and colleges right uh, the first thing i would say is you know university colleges indigenous institutes they're resilient organizations right mm -hmm. they they've been around for a long time this is a business that a business model if you will that's been around for a long time mm -hmm. the the disruption that we are going through right now that the entire world is going through is really um, looking at ways to adjust uh, how we approach uh, the delivery as, as we've been talking about. So I actually think that because we're resilient, our structures will be sound. I think that there will always be a role for publicly assisted post-secondary education to provide the credentials that the, our society needs and wants uh, in order to ensure that we've got well-informed citizens, well-prepared citizens, to um, to work in the economy, we want to make sure that we've got the the people that will take jobs, but also make jobs. So entrepreneurship, I know, is part of your portfolio, uh, and these are uh, entrepreneurship is a is a set of skills that can be taught and learned. And so I see us actually having you know a really solid good role to play there. Uh, the difference is in how people will come to us. So I don't think that it is the case any longer that the primary um, you know, learner coming into a post-secondary institution is somebody coming out of high school. And we all know that for many years that we have been uh, you know, learning a living, to use the, the phrase Marshall McLuhan coined many, many years ago, that lifelong learning is, is a fact and that while we will go through and get our first credential, we will always iterate to get more credentials. And what micro-credentials are doing is providing us with useful mechanisms by which we as post-secondary institutions, for instance, can say, yes, that, that learning is high quality, the competencies can be verified, and it's useful and usable in these particular contexts. Uh, and that what that is helping us do is, is providing the supports for the learners, regardless of when they're coming. Maybe they want to come into uh, post-secondary for a year and then go and work for a year, and then they can come back and then they can go back and work again. And the point is that what micro-credentials do is help us to provide the iterative, agile milestone markers along an educational pathway that helps one navigate their life and their career. And I guess the other thing I would say is we've always had micro-credentials, we just happen to call them courses. And those courses stack up into semesters, semesters stack up into degrees. And so really what we're talking about is, is a slightly different uh, nomenclature, uh, but um, we are we are rendering explicit 
some of the tacit assumptions that are already inherent in the way we approach education. We're just now doing this in a way that our learners would like to consume education or access education rather than the ways we would like to deliver it. And that to me is the biggest change. So back to those principles of human-centered design, thinking about this from the person who is coming into education, not how we would like to deliver education. And I, the last thing I would say, and this is most uh, trenchant for the university professoriate, is I think that what is what we need right now, uh, we need many things, is a change in how we think about tenure and promotion. Because tenure and promotion does not, in, in uh, my experience, adequately account for the fact that teaching and learning is a core component of our role as publicly paid uh, teachers at colleges and universities. And if we think a little bit more about, you know, what we are into now in terms of producing online and open educational resources, that we should make sure that people are rewarded for, in this case, tenure and promotion, for the production of online teaching resources, for the use of them, for the reuse, for the evaluation, and for the participation in communities of practice. And that will help us adapt to the the, the future, which, as I said, is now. Mm -hmm. Probably time for one more question. I know we have a few more. Um, this one is more about how does eCampus Ontario show its high quality and credential authority compared to other online learning websites? Um, so that's a good question. We do not confer credentials ourselves. Um, we work on behalf of our members, uh, which are all colleges and universities and two Indigenous institutes in the province. They are the ones that confer credentials. We provide the support for, um, so funding on the one hand to develop uh, online uh, and other collaboration and learning experiences uh, and the frameworks by which that can happen. So the sandbox, I talked about this, is one of the services that we provide to the sector. Uh, the collaborative virtual learning platform as well. On micro-credentials, we have a micro-credential framework that was co-created with the sector that is uh, used for um, for standing up these uh, micro-credential pilots, as I noted. Uh, but it's important for us, you know, for, for the, uh, the, the questioner there to understand that we are not uh, a body that confers credentials. We are uh, a, an organization that supports our post-secondary institutions to do that for our learners. Great. Robert, thank you very much for your time here. Uh, very much appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come here and speak to our audience today. Thank you. Well, that is all that we have time for today's sessions, uh, for this session of Business Builders. Um, joining, uh, joining me next week, uh, excuse me, on the next session, so that will be in two weeks' time, uh, for the Business Builders session is Deepak Chokra, who is the former CEO of Canada Post. And he's got a, a very exciting uh, topic that he will be talking about, and that is how COVID has affected the retail industry and how it may be um, kickstarting other vibrant renewal and other uh, other opportunities. Right? So that would be uh, that's a very very uh, informative, a very interesting, and as well timely topic to to discuss uh, when we're here uh, together next time. Um, I know there were a few other questions in there. Uh, I would welcome having further questions and we'll uh, aim to put those and have a response to as many as we, as we can. So thanks again to Robert for being here and thank you to all of you for taking time and taking a break with us today. Um, we'll see you again in two weeks time. Wishing everyone a wonderful, warm and safe uh, long weekend with family day coming up here in Ontario. Uh, on Monday. I hope many of you can join us next time when we're together. Until then, stay safe.